I understand you had some history in farming, is that yes. correct? Yes. Can you I, give me a little bit of uh, an overview first? Well, I grew up on the farm on Centennial Lane, New York City. Uh, I was born in 1942. And uh, my grandfather bought that farm in 1915, moved down from Frederick County. And uh, it was, I believe, when he came there, mostly a truck farm, but uh, gradually worked it into a strictly dairy farm over the years. Uh, but when he came, I understand there was sheep and chickens and turkeys and uh, cattle and uh, did a lot of fruit orchards and that type of thing. And I remember stories of my father telling about uh, harvesting this fruit or vegetables or whatever they did and hauled it into Baltimore like many other people were doing at that time. Uh, as I say, over the years it gradually worked into uh, strictly a dairy operation. And my father worked with his dad a good bit uh, on the farm there. Uh, things were moving along pretty good and my dad went into carpentry with his brother and then uh, Things seemed to start going downhill again. But uh, and Dad came back to the farm then, probably in the mid-30s, and took over the farm operation strictly himself and let his dad assist him. So it's kind of switched roles there. But um, So what was the size of your family at that point? When at you that time, I had, uh, well, it was mom and dad, and then we had uh, five children. I had two brothers and two sisters. I was, I was the middle child. Y your grandfather and was Charles, America's Figgy. Okay, interesting. So, the, A's, uh, the A's are staying, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, um, grandfather, on whose side? My father's side. Okay, so mm -hmm. your dad's dad. So, so let's. So the earliest you know is your grandfather. Yes. Had. A piece of property in Howard County. Right. It was how, how, what was that? It was a 163 acre farm and uh, it was a nice uh, variety of uh, pasture land as well as, uh, you know, crop land. Uh, the pastures each had a stream run through them where the cattle could uh, water themselves as necessary. Uh, there was four different divided pastures and. Um, so you, so you're earliest memories would be mm, I guess you might say 1945 somewhere there about I do remember 1945 well, I'd say give or take that I could really and say were, something about I would have been about three is when you were born? yeah three or four years old I guess and tell me what that can you remember some of that I do uh, remember not having electricity in the home I know Art talks about his uh, spiel with life before electricity and uh uh, I can relate to that very well. <laughs> I don't know whether he lived what, with what that or mean? not. What was it like? Uh, well, you used lanterns and candles. Uh, you didn't have uh, pressurized water to, to go with. Uh, we had uh, interesting sources of water. For cattle, we had two different sources. One, obviously, the streams. And uh, then we had a well that was driven by a little gas engine when it was necessary. And uh, then we had a, a spring that supplied our domestic water, and uh, that was driven by a ram. And a ram is a pump that is driven by the force of the water itself as it flowed downhill. Uh, it would capture the water in a pipe, and then that pipe run it into a device that would uh, allow the water to flow through to a certain pressure, and then it would have a little plunger that would pop up, stop that water flow, and it uh, allowed a certain amount of that water through pressure escape into a pipe. And that would, uh, it would sit there and pump like a heart. You just hear it pump, pump, pump if anybody's familiar with them. And uh, it would just pump 24 hours a day. And that supplied the water, it run water to a tank above the, in the attic, above the, in the house. And then that supplied your water for all your domestic use there. Uh, and it, our supply of drinking water did not come out of that tank. It came from a pipe that was 
feeding that tank. So you always had the freshest water to drink. And uh, rather than whatever went past that pipe that we drank from would go up into the tank. Now, prior to my years, I understand, once that tank above the, in the attic would uh, overflow, that would run over another pipe back to the barn to water the cattle. So as I say, you really had an interesting supply of water there on that place, which was kind of unusual. Where did the animals get their work? Either from the streams or again. Oh, streams on Streams the on each, yes. Mm -hmm. And we uh, yeah, did not... Uh, How many streams? Well, it was, it was two different streams, but they, the way the fields were set up, it would flow from one end to the next field. And uh, it was just kind of an ideal situation. In fact, that spring I talked about, what water was wasted from that ram pump run on downstream and the cattle were able to uh, drink from that as well. So uh, it, it was at kind the, of a unique At the time thing. of three, I'm sure you didn't count the cattle, but do you have a rough idea? Uh, the they cattle. probably were milking 10, 15 cows at that time, yeah. In and fact, these were all for milking? Yes. You, you, de you designed the, the, the fences in the fields so that each field had a stream yeah. and had water. Mm -hmm. And it was laid out uh, that way, and most of the cropland was to, shall we say, the south slightly enough that uh, you only had to cross one of the streams to get to the fields, and that was one of the smaller contributaries to the larger streams. So was, you could always cross that stream with your equipment as necessary without a problem. Uh, um, your, uh, remind me of your grandfather's first name again? Charles. So Charles, Charles, originally got the land yes. somehow? Mm -hmm. uh, in 1915. I, I don't know why or how they came down this way other than I think a relative had maybe suggested it that or knew of the farm being for sale. And he came down, he had eight children. Uh, and uh, at the time, I think the oldest ones are probably near age to get married. And uh, so as I say, it wasn't too long that they were all pretty much out of the house. But my father stayed there, and uh, then when my grandfather died in 1956, uh, my dad didn't buy the whole farm, so it got divided a little bit. And uh, he kept enough land there to farm, and still farm. Did you ever learn any stories from your grandfather about farming, his style of farming? Uh, well, they, I still remember them working with horses, too. Uh, and, remember, uh, I mean, like you could see it in your head? Did, did, did you watch them? Well, I watched them. I physically watched them, uh, you know, mow and rake hay with the horses. I was a little young to be able to get out there and do things uh, on the farm with that style of uh, equipment. Uh, but uh, my older brother used to, uh, between loads of hay, he'd get on the one horse and ride it around the yard or whatever. It was, it was just work, work horses. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, uh, it was, that was so, a fun thing. <laughs> that's, that's great. So you're, um, so somebody, I mean, so your dad was already working for your grandfather. Yes. His father. Mm -hmm. And he was doing mostly some some field raising of plant for crops or no how was up, up until 1957 we uh, you know grew all of our own crops I mean it was a so we call self substantial farm uh, my grandfather used to do a lot of gardening but uh, the, the the farm itself we grew our own hay and corn and barley and so on and you know grazed our own cattle uh, prior to let's say we had I guess we got electricity around 1946. 47. Uh, in fact, I told somebody a few years ago about them or knowing that, you know, working and not having electricity. And he kind of, he was about my age, and he looked at me with a twisted head kind of thing. You know, you got to be kidding. So, but, you know, I do remember it. <laughs> yeah, we, did, we got electricity in 1949 on our farm. Did you? Okay. I was 10 years old when we got electricity. All right. Do you, so, yeah. how, what do you, when you got electricity, how old do you think you were? Probably five, thereabout. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So what, what was your earliest experience in saying that 
the switch work or this light? Oh, that, that was fascinating. You know, that you, <laughs> because uh, you, know, you had one light in a, in a room, no outlets or anything of that sort. Uh, per room, you had one light. And I think eventually, uh, say eventually they probably had a couple of outlets somewhere throughout the house, but not any large number of them. <laughs> and, uh, Did you ever hear we, the story of how they got electricity? No. Uh, it was there. We just didn't tie into it. I guess there was fees involved uh, in that. But uh, Who made the decision? Probably my grandfather. Cause he was still pretty much in control of the uh, You don't think your, your father is more of the advancer in farming? He probably was, as I say, that same time. There was kind of a... Uh, together decision idea of which way to go. Uh, as I say, still working with horses. My father used to uh, get a tractor on loan from time to time to do some of the plowing or certain crop doing. And uh, uh, But then the interesting thing there is when we did switch from uh, horses to tractors, uh, the phone company was putting in new phone lines and they just dropped the wires in the fields and uh, you know, put up the new lines and so on. Well, the horses got tangled up in those wires and tore their feet up pretty bad. So they you know, paid for them. They, uh, you know, insurance or whatever it was, covered the, the cost of the horses. But instead of buying new horses, then daddy switched to a tractor. That's when he bought his first tractor. Do you remember what it was? It was? 1949. Marmol H. Cool. It did spin up there at the Machine Club. We have one in the museum. Marmol H. And it still has a home used, just used about a mile from here. Yeah, the, uh, the le electricity in tractors in the 1940, there was a transition where, the, uh, where all farms were getting electricity just about the same time that all farms, farmers wanted a tractor. And that was just a modern way of doing things. And many of the, the uh, farm implements that were originally pulled by horses were adapted for the tractor, yeah. as Chris mentioned. I mean, we, we always didn't get new combines, self-propelled combines. We used the same equipment that we used for that the horses or the mules pulled, including binders and yeah. plows. And we just transitioned to tractors. So yeah. you just had to feed them gasoline. That's all. <laughs> Didn't have to feed them hay or oats yeah. or barley or anything else. At the time, did anybody figure, you know, was gas more, you know, farms have operating budgets, farms have uh, future planning and survival is a key thing about a farm, right? So did, at the time, was any, this is for both of you, did anybody ever consider, you know, well, electricity and gas are out there. Now my monthly... I call it a house nut, but you call, you, a farmer would call it different. But you know what I'm talking about? The operation expenses to get, you know, the final results, which means get the, the milk out in your case or get mm -hmm. uh, animals slaughtered. And I don't know if that was Art's case, but the point I'm getting at is, do you remember how to weigh out, you know, did it, did it become a cost effective decision to make or to become, I, well, everybody's doing this and I have to take a small loss because the over -operating exp overall operating expenses went up. Can you comment on that? I, I would say with the way you just described it is very, uh, uh, very true. Uh, it, it was just a different transition in life. Uh, it just like grow it up, I guess. But uh, yeah, you had to weigh that factor. Is it worth it to, uh, proceed or proceed a little, work a little harder. Uh, he probably took on another cow or, or two to help with the production, uh, which meant a little more work, different ways, a little more feed and so on. But that was all factored in, I guess, uh, just like you would today. You know? well, if you ever uh, had to work with horses or mules, you, and you had to provide the stables and the feed and the, and the uh, it was it was not very pleasant. Let's put it that way. It was another almost another whole operation to take care of your animals, 
Uh, you had to grow the feed and the hay, et cetera, for them. You had to care for them. It was a whole operation just taking care of the horses in order to, you know, farm. So that aspect of it, when you finished, once you got into your tractors, at the end of the day, you pulled it in the machinery shed and you got off one, you know, about whatever else you had to do. If you had horses, you had to, you know, groom them, feed them, all that type of thing. And then another thing, uh, the, the tractor dealerships were becoming pretty plentiful. Yeah. And they were coming trying to encourage you to buy a tractor. And it looked very appealing. I mean, they were strong and they only needed gas. You pulled them into the shed and you were done for the day. Uh, so all, all the farmers did transition to the tractors. <coughs> yeah. So, but let's go back to, I mean, that shows me that there's a great, it was a great benefit and, and, a, and a smart thing to do. But did anybody ever measure out the cost factor in operating the farm in comparing the gas and comparing the wear on the tractor, whether it needed maintenance? Probably not that so much for the new ones, but you know, in other words, is it, did you, do you have any recall of what that was? At that age, no, I don't. Uh, I don't just, uh, what, no. Okay, so let's go back to, this, is, this brings up an important point. Now, your dad and you started to begin to show some interest in farming, him mm -hmm. showing, showing you. Correct. Do you remember the earliest times of when that occurred? I think I was interested probably from seven or eight years old. I, I seemed to take more interest in it than my brothers. And uh, my younger brother says, too much work for me. This was his later years. He said, <laughs> it's too much work for him. My older brother, he did have uh, asthma or hay fever type of thing, and uh, he couldn't handle the dust and the, the, that type of thing on the farm. So uh, he went, he was old enough, he joined the Air Force and had a, went into a different life. What time. was your, what was your, uh, where did you fit in the, in the ages? I forgot the I'm, I'm the center, the middle child. Okay. Uh, it's five, you said? Five of us, okay. older brother and sister, and then a okay. younger brother and sister. You, did any of the other four go into farming? No, no. So how did that make you feel like you were the only one that's uh, actually getting this opportunity? <laughs> I won't say too much about that. <laughs> I was probably called the fool. <laughs> Gotta be a better way to make a living. <laughs> that's what my younger brother used to tell me. <laughs> so you, uh, let's go back to that morning when you were seven or eight years old. Tell me what a typical seven or eight year old day was like with, was your grandfather, you know, still living? Yes, he was. So, relate that to me? Yeah, uh, as I say, I remember my grandfather mostly uh, leading horses or working with the horses some, but he did mostly gardening. He was up in his late 70s by that time, I guess, and, uh, and mostly I remember him doing gardening work or a little uh, repair jobs, piddling, I call it, uh, minor things such as that, and my dad usually was doing the heavy work and, and so on. Uh, he, Daddy didn't let us on the tractor too much. Uh, safety was probably the main thing, but I always said to my brother, that was a new toy to him. He didn't know anybody else playing with it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, okay. again, along with that transition, you know, uh, from electric to, uh, to electric, uh, I do remember not physically uh, being in the barn milking the cows, but you know, cows are obviously milked by hand. Uh, you didn't have the electric coolers to cool your milk. The milk had to be put in cans, obviously, and carried to, there's again another tributary to that spring. The milk was carried down to a spring house and set in line of a little uh, trench in that little building and that kept the milk cool until the truck came to pick it up from the, uh, at that time, I think it was the aristocrat dairy in Baltimore. He used to come by every day and pick up the milk and cans. So we had a, a little milk can cart that used to haul the cans from the barn down to that dairy. And uh, uh, yes, two-wheeled cart. And uh, so uh, that, that was so another when operation. So you got involved at seven or eight, uh, herd was the same? Uh, yeah, we were probably milking 15 cows thereabout, and uh, 
as I say, I, our duties were, well, you had chickens back then as well, so you, you know, had to gather the eggs and feed chickens and we fed calves and that type of thing. And uh, you had similar chores when you got home from school as well. So uh, we, we were busy, occupied, didn't have much time to go running around. So, so now uh, you went away, for, you weren't homeschooled? Correct. Yeah. You went away? I went away to, to St. Louis School in Clarksville. Uh, uh, How'd you get Bus, believe it or not. They were county buses. Uh, we rode with the public school children at that time. So and, now let's uh, talk about a week. Yes. Again, you're seven, eight, nine, ten a week. How did you, so now you've got double responsibility. You're educating yourself. Well, of course, the teachers are helping. And, <laughs> and you have the responsibilities your dad's been helping you with, or, you know, asking you to help with on the mm -hmm. farm. What was a typical time, you know, like your day? Uh, you got up in the morning, 6 or 6.30, I guess, and you did some of those quick chores, et cetera, and uh, we uh, had to be on the bus by 7.30 most of the time. So uh, what you didn't get done in the morning, you would uh, you had to get into in the afternoon when you got home, probably sometime after 4.30 thereabout. It seemed like a long day, and I remember my parents commenting about how long it was at school, on the bus, etc. Uh, so, uh, but you had the, as I say, those duties to take care of the, with the animals. And okay, so else. you're a young guy, you, you've been helping your dad, and now the weekend comes up. How did you work that out? Weekends were pretty much like weekdays. So yeah, was wasn't much difference. Uh, but didn't you want to be with friends? Didn't you want to have fun? Uh, didn't think about it too much. We didn't know most of our relatives because we never went anywhere to, yeah. I mean, you, you, the cows needed milking in the morning and the evening. And yeah. Other than going to church on Sunday, that was your only social aspect, other than going to a, a carnival yeah. or a picnic someplace, I mean a church picnic. Uh, it was a seven, farming was a seven day a week job. Yeah. How about for you? Uh, I think we had a unique situation there on our place. Because I lived with, I uh, say I, you know, our family lived with my grandparents. And all in the same house. All in the same home. And they had children that was local, you know, all seven children. They had one that became a nun. But the others were all married. And they always came to visit their father and mother, which was my grandparents. And they would bring their children and visit as well. And I knew all of my cousins. I had 31 first cousins. But I knew all of them. And that was a unique thing. That was our entertainment. We loved to see them come, uh, you know, as I say, the children, you know, grandmoms, grandpaps, children would visit with them. And their children, when they would come with their parent, we'd, we'd play tag and play school on the steps and all these games that children would do. And uh, so it, it was a neat thing to be able to do that I can say that not every child has that opportunity. So. Um, this is a serious question. Do you remember the passing of your grandfather? Yes. Can you tell me when, about what he uh, I was probably 12 or 13, and uh, it was 1956. Uh, he, he again had had pneumonia and was being treated for it, but uh, all his life he had asthma, and uh, he always needed to get fresh air from time to time. He had to go to the window and walk outside. Well, I think he was being treated for pneumonia. It was winter time, and. Uh, he went over to a window to get air. And interesting thing, he walked, at, it was a roof over a porch, and he walked across that porch and fell off the porch. He didn't slip, there was snow on the roof, and there was just one footprint clearly right after the other, no slipping, and he just stepped off the end of that. And, uh, what did, you so believe, he died. what did you believe that to be? Just delirious from the medication he was on. 
too much medication for this uh, illness he was experiencing at that time. In his lungs, you said? Yes. But when he fell, I think he broke some ribs and probably collarbone and maybe a punctured lung. And he only lived maybe a couple days. And uh, that was in February. Grandma had died from congestive heart failure just a month or so prior to that. So it was kind of, uh, you know, lose both of them. So you and your dad had a whole new concept to deal with at this point in terms of survival, in terms well, of harm. Mostly him, more than me. <laughs> but, yeah. Well, you were 13. I mean, yeah. that's pretty much a young man at that mm -hmm. point in time. What, how, what was it like? How did, let's say, how did you continue farming? What was it like then? Well, he continued to ship milk uh, as he had, uh, again, he had upgraded from you know, the way I mentioned earlier without electricity. He had to put in a cooler, <coughs> excuse me, a cooler to hold the milk in the dairy there. And then the truck came right to the dairy and picked the cans up. And, uh, but he th didn't know that he was going to be able to buy a part of the farm at that time. So uh, he had sold the cows, the milk cows. He kept the young stock. Uh, not knowing exactly what direction he was going to go. So in the meantime, a gentleman came along and bought, bought probably 60 or so acres. It was 163 acres. So he bought basically the best cropland because he wanted probably to develop, you know, little houses. So, but it was enough to continue to farm there. And uh, when was this? It, it was 1957 is when that took place. And, uh, but the income then was not quite enough to make things. So Ted uh, went back into carpentry and uh, he had carpentered some when he was in younger years. So uh, he uh, just went back into doing some carpentry along with taking care of the, the, the farm there. By that time I was in high school and I always wanted to farm. So uh, as I graduated, I said, uh, instead of selling the cow, you know, he would breed and have the young stock. When they would have calves, then he would sell them. Daddy had experience in carpentry, and I remember sitting at the dinner table one afternoon on a Sunday. Uh, he had a friend who was a building inspector for the county, and uh, he came in the house, as he frequently visited, and said, uh, Herman, why don't you let come down to the building department, we need building inspectors. I said, with your background, you know, that would be good for us. And that, he didn't say that would give Chris his own opportunity, but it did, and Daddy did that, and uh, then it let me totally on my own start making those decisions, whether they were good or bad. And uh, I guess I was old enough at that time, Daddy figured, you know, do it yourself now. So uh, I proceeded to uh, say rent the property from him uh, and did things kind of my way. And uh, so I did uh, buy some more equipment, but I was a conservative person. Uh, I would, you know, save, always did save. I can remember doing that from a young child. And uh, so I spent money wisely and uh, always think of the time I went to an auction to buy another tractor and I wound up buying a baler. So uh, it was uh, just one of those things. The price was right for the baler, but the tractor was more. So I eventually did get, did get a second tractor, which made you know life so much easier, because particularly when you were working the, uh, the field or so on. If you were you had to unhook from one piece of equipment, hook it up to another one, go back to this one, and. Uh, that type of thing. So the two tractors, as anybody can attest, this has made a tremendous difference. Uh, so let me back up some, because I didn't get an idea from when your father and grandfather are farming and you were only six or seven or eight. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's now the end of the, uh, the growing season. How yes. did you all get those crops together to, to use? Did, did you go to the community for help? Just a different... You know, there were different yeah. Well, one, one phase of it particularly we did, uh, threshing 
the wheat or the uh, crops such as that was not something that all farmers had the equipment to do. And uh, as I, say, I can remember as a child, seeing that done with the old trash machine that was uh, uh, leased or rented from various uh, farmers around the area. The and Mr. Frank, uh, who was, uh, you know very well with our machinery club, uh, he was, uh, his dad was the, the main man on running around and doing this uh, commercial harvesting. And uh, I can remember him very well coming in there. He seemed to be, it was almost like a trade. <laughs> You'd have the tractor and then the thrash machine and the wagon behind that, along with a bale or maybe a bale or between. And as I say, it just looked like a train coming through the road. But uh, I remember them, you know, setting up in the field. And uh, it was an interesting time there too, because as I say, just memories, but the, we still had prisoners from World War II that would, you could hire out. And there was a place down on, I think St. John's Lane 144, that they would bring a busload of prisoners out to that point and the farmers could go to there and pick up three or four of them, sign them out or whatever, and use them for the day. And uh, so that was they, like your spring harvest. Well, it was, uh, yeah, the, the yeah they would come in the fall of the year, the harvesting there. Labor force. But labor force, yes. And uh, I don't know how much or if how much they even had to pay them, but uh, at least from my what my father said. They enjoyed coming to our place to work. Uh, sometimes they weren't treated as well as they should have been, uh, from what I was told, but they loved it. In fact, there was a farm supply store at that same location where they picked them up. And my dad went down to pick up something one day, and a couple of them come running over, get in the car. He says, Oh, I'm sorry, fellas, I don't need you today. because. Uh, but it was a big thing when we uh, did that thrashing part, particularly it seemed to me <coughs> you would have, I guess my mother may have had some help come in there to help her because we used to, have, it was almost like a big feast lunchtime. I mean, they had, they fed these guys like they were kings, I guess. But uh, as kids, we just had to keep our distance and just watch and see what was going on. But uh, that, to me, I recall being the, the big thing, feeding all these guys. It seemed to me it was 15 or 20, but it probably was more than six or seven. <laughs> when my brother and I, uh, when the thrash machine used to come to our place, and it was Mr. Franks also, uh, my brother and I were too young to work with the equipment. So, I mean, we were like seven, eight, nine years old. So we were the water boys. We carried right. the water from the spring uh, over in, in, a, in a bucket and had a dipper and everybody drank out of the same dipper. We didn't know what germs were those days. That's right. And uh, uh, the, the, the spring was a lot, the spring house was a lot closer to the, the thrashing operation than the, than the house was. We had a, a pump, por a pump on the porch. We didn't have electricity either. And, uh, and so it's, and the water that came out of the spring was really cold. It was like ice cold. So everybody appreciated that. And we didn't have any, we didn't use German prisoners uh, for any of that operation. It seemed that the, uh, uh, we had relatives, uh, my uncle, a couple of my uncles from St. John's Lane, as a matter of fact, because, and some of my cousins. And, uh, and, and generally there was three or four other people who just followed the thrashing crew around all summer mm -hmm. when they did the thrashing. I can relate to everything Chris is saying. <laughs> so, but, uh, so that was one of the neat memories as a kid that I remember. And then when I got involved in the Farm Machinery Club, I was 10 or 12 years ago. Oh, uh, we're not, we're not, uh, that's we're not right. there yet. I'm gonna relate back to that because <coughs> when I got involved in that, we had a breakdown one day and found myself underneath this thrash machine, helping to repair the thrasher so we could continue to put on the demonstration. And I thought it was just a neat feeling to be there, thinking, remembering back when I was a kid, 
seeing it happen, not being able to even get close to it, but then uh, actually taking part in the operation, uh, not only the operation, but the repairing of the equipment. So it was kind of neat. So, so, the, so the, the end of summer um, seems like you were start, starting to start, start into early fall festival kind of life. I mean, it sounds like the, the women in the family got involved, and it sounds like you had well, yeah. meals, and you had a get-together, mm -hmm. much like, you know, the um, fall harvest festival type of a situation that kind of is, today yeah. has evolved into, mm -hmm. but it yeah. sounds like you were in those early days of the, uh, the spirit of getting... It was, yeah, I guess it was going on, and you were involved in it and didn't even know it or think about it. You could look back and say, now it was kind of a festival, and that was your enjoyment. But uh, at the time, it was just a way of life. Uh, as they did the threshing then, uh, same way with uh, cutting corn. Uh, you'd go down and get some of these fellows, or maybe relatives, as Art re referred to, uh, you know, make a team. You get out and you'd, uh, cut the corn, put it in the shocks. And uh, I can remember as a kid, still using the horses, we were small enough or large enough, we say, but the, the operation of the corn, you would cut it, put it in the shocks in the field, and then you'd come back later and husk it out. And then you'd have this huge pile of corn on the ground, and uh, then you'd go along with the wagon and gather that corn up throw it on the wagon, and then you show it from the wagon into the corn crib. But as kids, when you're throwing this stuff on the wagon, and so on, you'd hit one another in the head with it. You know? And then you'd wind up in a fight among one another. You did it all purpose and all this kind of stuff. So they, they, you look back now, you laugh about it. Uh, at the time, it was probably a serious operation. But you probably got a little scolding from your dad for it, and that kind of thing as well. But it was all, all in fun, I guess. I beat around. I got married in August and beat around for about four or five months and I did a little bit of farming with different ones, you know, assisting, helping farming for the fall. But Christmas time, the priest that married me, I saw him at the church and he asked what I was doing because he knew I had farmed. I said, well, I'm just basically looking for a good job. And so he described this job to me. He said, you know, farmers are not experts at anything, but they're very proficient at lots of things. They are self-sufficient people. And he said, uh, I know somebody that needs how to maintain, take care of, do, and physical work. So I said, yeah. I'll do it. I said, who are we talking about? Where is he? He said, me. I can still remember him taking this drink and saying, me. So this was the pastor at St. Louis Church School, Clarksville. And he said, you know, it's kind of a security job. He said, it's a school and a church and a parish. He said, it'll be here forever. So as long as you want to do, you know, maintenance work, crowd yard work, building maintenance, and so on. Uh, he said, you have a job. So that's where I stayed for 37 years. <laughs> so uh, That's a very interesting transition, and uh, certainly had its benefits, though. It did. It was close by. He was an excellent man to work for. Uh, and just, I was had the ability to be my own boss in a way, just the same as I was. He said, you're in charge. He said, you take care of the buildings and crowns, and I'll take care of the people. And it worked. It was great. Did you, did you have to dig any grave sites? Not physically, but I, I was very much in charge of the cemetery we had there. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. let's go back to you growing up. Do you remember how you if you ever got sick, and we're talking about early days, six, seven, eight years old, mm -hmm. how did you guys get medical help? Well, there was local doctors. There's Dr. Whitaker, which is, his office is still just a mile up the road, and Dr. Evelyn Jackson is there now. 
Uh, he was one, there was another one in Ellicott City. Uh, and it seemed to me I was the accident prone one. <laughs> uh, we had a, uh, there's an old, we called it, uh, just called it the old house. It was a log house there on the yard. It was part of a tenant house at one time, I guess, but we used it for grain storage. But uh, there was some items in there, whatever, we were breaking up and I kicked whatever it was and a spoke went into my shin. I had to go to the doctor and had that removed. Uh, there was an old ice house that was not in use when I was little, but it was collapsed and all that type of thing. We used to fill it up with trash and eventually covered it up with dirt, but we were throwing glass or whatever in there, breaking them up, and a piece flew back, and I still got the scar on the arm here from that incident. Thank God it didn't hit me in the face, you know? Uh, and I remember falling in through something and cracking my head there, but the big bad thing was when I was four years old, we were still getting hay in the barn, loose hay, and uh, I was playing around with one of the uh, pulleys, that device that, it was a series of pulleys that you had to have in order for the horse to be able to drag the hay up into the barn. I was playing around with one of those pulleys and got my hand caught into it. And I lost the little fingernail, a scar all the way across the back of my hand. And uh, yeah, I wound up at the doctor's office and in the hospital there for a couple of days. So, uh, but I was, as I say, I think I was probably hurt more than the others. Not that I was so much more adventurous. I guess I was just the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> Did your uh, mom or grandmother practice any folk type medicine? Uh, yeah, we did mostly our own stuff. I can remember a lot of iodine and alcohol and uh, bandages, no band-aids. I don't know whether we even out then, but uh, yeah, we took care of most of our own things. But when you got something serious like this was, you obviously went the other direction. The only other, my brother, older brother, got appendicitis. I think he's the only other one that wound up in the hospital. Mother, father did not have any insurances, health insurances or anything of that sort. And he said, that's why I was always yelling at you all the time to, you be careful, don't do this and that type of thing. Because he says, I didn't have insurance to cover it. So, uh, and maybe many others didn't either. But, uh, did you ever miss farming? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. I guess we maintained, when the dad stopped milking cows, we still maintained a cow for our own milk use. And again, I was home, I was wound up milking that cow. That's, you know, every day, you had to be here twice a day, morning and evening. And I said, uh, you know, if I'm gonna have to be milking one cow, gotta be here, I may as well be milking a bunch. And that's what one of the drivers for me to go into, you know, farming a little, bigger on my own as well, so, uh, you know, through high school and then beyond. So, and it didn't change, as I say, it, it didn't bother me that much to be milking 10, you had to be there regardless, so. Uh, so will you, uh, probably, you haven't even thought about this before, but can you list roughly all the equipment, farm equipment that you learned to use? Uh, oh yeah, I had to plow and discs and, Corn planters, uh, grain drills, fertilizer spreaders, mowers, rakes, uh, and balers, miller spreaders, you know, all those. Uh, we didn't have our own corn picker. We did, again, have to uh, hire out the corn picker, but we uh, had the equipment to handle it beyond that point. And uh, used to have to take our feed to uh, Sykesville, at that time there was a, a Southern States. I used to take grain up there and have it mixed with other feeds that you purchased to uh, mix it and bring it, bag it and bring it back and feed that way. But we were still able to grow most of our own hay. I had enough field crop there. But I would, again, when I was working it because of the less tillable acreage, uh, I had to buy a lot of hay and that type of thing. So but it's still managed. Where did you get your food supplies when you were a kid? Uh, there, 
I remember my mother shopping at, what's it called, Acme? Acme and the other on side. On the other side of the bridge in Ellicott, in Ellicott City. City, just across the railroad tracks on, in the Baltimore County on Frederick Road. So when you were farming those 10 years, mm -hmm. and I know you were very, very involved and very, very busy <clears> and a lot of responsibility just being on the farm, but were you able to develop any farming buddies? Not really, no. I, uh, I guess I concentrated too hard <laughs> on taking care of the operations. So okay. I guess I got you had a lot to do. Down. So I'm trying to get a sense if you had any um, knowledge or awareness or experience as a farm community while you were in that 10 years of being a farmer. Well, I did. I had relatives that were farmers uh, as well, and uh, I guess, again, they were my mentors as well. And uh, as I said, I didn't have one cousin, his, one of his mottos was no risk, no gain. And uh, he was one that pushed me to, not push, but you know, recommended uh, some different operations. For example, the silo, the trench silo, which is just a hole dug into the side of a hill. And you know, he said, uh, you know, put one of those in, put your corn in there, you get better uh, usage out of your corn and you know, the, the field of crop itself. And you use the whole stalk instead of just taking the ears and so on. So that's what I did. And he, he made it uh, uh, appealing to me. He says, you put that thing in and I'll come down and pack it down for you and I'll make sure that I had to pay somebody to come in and harvest it and fill it. But he, bought his tractor down and packed it down for me that first year for, for free. So it was just a, it was a day's work with a tractor, but uh, that was a, you know, incentive. And then that winter time that following year, I bought my own loader for the tractor. I was able to do it myself at that point. But uh, just things such as that, we, we would, I would visit him a lot of times and he did, we'd stay up till 12 o'clock at night talking and that type of thing. But, uh, so he was, he was a good fellow. And of course, uh, the cousins, Charlie, who you uh, interviewed here, Charlie and Paul both, I mean, they were people that I tried to strive to seriously keep up with or uh, be well, my, again, my mentor. Maybe? Well, not so much competition. They were just my leaders. You know, you, you tried to strive to, to do as well as they were. They had two tractors and maybe three or a little better equipment and it kind of made you think, okay, I could, you know, maybe I should do this or do that type of thing, you know, maybe milk a few more cows or et cetera. But for the size of the acreage that I had there, I was pretty much cattle full. Uh, if you're milking 25 cows, you got to have 25 head of young stock, whether they're from calves up to breeding time, and calving time. So, uh, it's, it was, you know, about all I could handle there with close to 50 head of cattle. So. Wow. I've learned a lot. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Yeah.